Welcome as friends, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy for the date 11th of March 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles we will be going through today. Now let's start our discussion. Look at this article here. It is about a report prepared by the Niti Yog. The report is named Production and Promotion of Organic and Biofertilizers with Special Focus on Improving Economic Viability of Gaushalas. According to the report, Gaushalas can become major suppliers of input for natural farming. Those who do not know what a Gaushala is, look at this image. Can you see what they are? Yes, they are cow shelters. See the report is saying that these cow shelters can provide inputs for natural farming. If you are wondering what inputs, it is nothing but manure and bioproducts made of cow urine and cow dung. This will be significant because nowadays farmers are reducing the use of agrochemicals such as fertilizers and pesticides. This is because of economic, health, environment and sustainability reasons. So if the Gaushalas provide inputs for natural farming, they will improve economically. This is like a win-win situation. Gaushalas will help in promoting natural farming and organic farming. In turn, Gaushalas will benefit economically. This will improve the working conditions of Gaushalas. Know that Gaushalas can address the problems of stray cattle also. Here stray cattle are animals such as cow, bulls, oxen and buffaloes that roam freely. A particular animal is called a stray when the owner of the animal cannot be determined. The problem with stray cattle is that they have damaged the crops in many parts of the country. According to the report, the population of stray cattle is estimated at 53 lakh. So, this could be addressed by improving the economic conditions of Gaushalas across the country. Secondly, improved condition of Gaushalas help in achieving a Gandhian principle in DPSP. It is none other than Article 48. Article 48 state that the state shall take steps for preserving and improving cattle breeds and prohibiting slaughter of cows, calves and other milch and rot animals. See, I am telling you all this because you can use these points in your main sensor. How? See, UPSC likes to ask questions related to agriculture and means of doubling farmers' income. We all know that agriculture in India has always been based on integrated approach. Integrated approach in a sense, growing crops on one hand and rearing livestock on the other hand. If you have visited any village, you would know this. Every farmer will have a cattle and other livestock. This is to earn income from these livestock by selling milk, cow dung, goat meat, etc. But after green revolution, this approach has changed. This is because the agricultural yield increased due to the use of high yielding variety seeds and synthetic fertilizers. So, farmers got their income from cultivation of crop itself. This is good only, but think about it. Concentrating solely on cultivation of crops burdens the soil nutrient balance. This again affects the yield of the crops and in turn income of the farmers. So again, farmers started to follow the integrated approach nowadays. If a question is asked in UPSC mains exam regarding doubling the farmers income, then you can write all the points that we discussed now relating to the economics of Gaushala. You can even write the other benefits we get from promoting Gaushalas, which is none other than the role of Gaushalas in addressing the problem of stray cattle and its role in help achieving Article 48. Now, before concluding our discussion, let us see some points about zero budget natural farming. Zero budget natural farming is popularized by Mr. Shubhash Palekar. It is a process of raising crops without using chemical fertilizers and pesticides or any other external materials. Instead, farmers use low cost, locally sourced natural products which are based on cow dung, cow urine, jaggery, green chilies, and many other natural ingredients. The term zero budget here means zero cost of production of all crops. Zero budget natural farming guides the farmers in practicing sustainable farming that helps in retaining soil fertility. So, this method ensures chemical free agriculture and reduction in cost of production. I have given here the principles of zero budget natural farming. You can pause the video and go through it. So, that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw how the economics of Gaushalas can be improved by making it supply raw material for natural farming. We also saw the other advantages of promoting Gaushalas. Finally, we saw some points about zero budget natural farming. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Now, let us take up this article for our discussion. It says that two Palestinians were killed in a clash in West Bank. One person was killed by a Israeli settler in the occupied West Bank. 
and a teenager was killed by the soldier see we are not going to see why these persons were killed instead we will see some exam related facts about this west bank region first of all where is this west bank located to know that look at this image here can you locate the west bank region in this map it is located between israel and jordan see as the name suggest it lies on the west bank of river jordan as you can see here it is bounded by israel to the north west and south to the east lies jordan and it is located north of the dead sea know that this territory belongs to palestine this is about the location of west bank now let us see how west bank came into being the entire region of modern israel and palestine was once belonged to the palestinian state and it was home to the palestinians meaning arab people but this was only till 1948 israel arab war of independence palestine was among the former ottoman territories placed under uk administration by the league of nations in 1922 all these territories eventually became fully independent states except palestine under the british mandate it incorporated the balfour declaration of 1917 This declaration turned the Zionist aim of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine into a reality. Here let us take a quick detour and understand what Zionism means. Zionism refers to the national movement for the return of Jewish people to their homeland and the resumption of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Now coming back to the declaration. The aim of Zionism was fulfilled by Balfour Declaration. This is because through the declaration Britain publicly pledged to establish a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine so accordingly large scale Jewish migration took place from Europe the migrant numbers increased in the 1930s with the Nazi prosecution of Jews due to this the Arabs demanded for independence and started showing resistance to immigration This resistance led to the rebellion of 1937 followed by continuing terrorism and violence from both the sides in the region. UK considered various formulas to bring independence and peace to the region. But finally in 1947 the UK turned the Palestine problem over to the United Nations. The United Nations proposed two things. One is terminating the British mandate over the region the other is partitioning Palestine into two independent states consisting of one Palestinian Arab state and the other one being a Jewish state so when the British mandate ended over Palestine the Jewish people's council gathered at the Tel Aviv museum and declared independence of the state of Israel on May 14 1948 This only led to the war of Arab Israel independence. In this war other nearby Arab states fought against Israel but Israel clearly won the 1948 war. The end of the war resulted in Israeli forces controlling approximately 78% of the historical Palestine. The remaining 22% fell under the administration of Egypt and Jordan and this 22% comprised of West Bank region and the Gaza strip. but again a war broke out in 1967 this time the war was fought between israel on one side and egypt jordan and uh, syria on the other side in this war also israel clearly won during this war the state of israel shocked the whole world this is because israel through this war seized the remaining palestinian territories of west bank east jerusalem gaza strip syrian golan heights and the egyptian sinai peninsula in a matter of just 6 days but the sinai peninsula was returned to egypt in multiple stages beginning in 1979 as a part of egypt israel peace treaty so as of now israeli forces are occupying west bank also don't get confused okay there's a country named palestine but israeli forces are occupying the territory of palestine this is because israel wanted to protect itself from the attack of neighboring arab countries now look at the settlement map by the settlement map you can clearly understand what i am trying to convey as you can see in this image all the light violet color region is under the control of israeli forces and the dark violet indicates the settlements of israel since palestine also contains arab population israel is occupying the territory as a defensive measure see this is not my reasoning this is what is said by the israeli forces they are saying that its presence is important mainly in the jordan valley because it is strategically vital for israel's self defense so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the location of west bank 
and we also saw how the west bank region came into being so i hope this discussion was useful and informative now let us conclude this and take up the next news article have a look at this editorial article this article is talking about the deteriorating relationship between china and the united states of america the article says that the downward slide in relations between the us and china is appearing to be irreversible this is because both the countries are confronting each other for various reasons china is accusing that the usa is trying to encircle china apart from this china is also facing unprecedented challenges for its development this is because of all round containment and suppression by western countries led by united states if you look at the united states the us is continuously accusing china for its trade discrimination policies and spying activities as we all know during last january a chinese balloon was sighted over us territory the us claimed that it was a spy balloon and subsequently shot it down because of this event a scheduled visit by the united states secretary of state antony blinken to china was cancelled this hindered the us decision to restart engagement with china on one side china is planning a major central asian summit this year to showcase its strength on the other hand the us is shoring up alliances and partnership in the asian region these kinds of activities are not only affecting china and the united states but the world as a whole because if the rivalry continues it may end up in a cold war like situation and it will destabilize the peace in the world This is all about the editorial given here. Now, in this backdrop, let us understand the reasons for deteriorating China-US relations and about the implications of the deteriorating China-US relations to the world as a whole. Let's start with the reasons for the deteriorating China-US relations. As we all know, both the United States of America and China differ in their core ideologies. See, US is a democratic country, whereas China is a authoritarian country. These ideological differences are one of the main reasons for the quarrel between the two countries. Despite this fact, the US and the China have established their diplomatic relations in the later part of the Cold War. After that, both countries have worked towards economic progress. See a decade back, China rose to the status of second largest economy in the world and established itself into the global economy. This eventually fueled China's growing economic competence as well as its rising political ambitions. So, China started to undermine US global dominance through its military and diplomatic means. China's aggressiveness rose further under Xi Jinping's administration. In case of the United States, after Mr. Donald Trump became president, the US's concern about a threat from China reached critical levels. The Trump administration took confrontational steps towards China. The Trump administration had imposed tariffs on China's exports to the United States. On its part, China also reciprocated by imposing tariffs on US's export to China. This turned into a trade war and it started to reverse the trajectory of US-China relations. After that, in 2021, Mr. Biden succeeded Mr. Trump. Despite the change in power, the policy of the United States of America and China did not change significantly. This is because China followed Wolf Warrior diplomacy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Here, Wolf Warrior diplomacy is an aggressive and confrontational type of diplomacy adopted by Chinese diplomats. It was used by Chinese diplomats particularly against the West during the COVID-19 pandemic when the entire world blamed China for the pandemic. Apart from this, currently China is supporting Russia in the Ukraine crisis and Ukraine is backed by US and its allies. Here also there is an invisible confrontation happening between the United States and China. In addition to this, many spying balloons of China were spotted over US territory in recent times. This also has hampered the engagement between these two nations. These are some of the reasons for the deteriorating relationship between China and the United States. Now we will understand about the implications of the deteriorating US China relations. The growing rivalry between US and China may end up in a cold war. We have witnessed the consequences of cold war between US and the Russia. If cold war emerges again, then there would be a arms race between China and the USA. In addition to this, both countries will tend to engage in forming alliances to showcase each other's power. This kind of activities will disturb the peace in the world. Apart from this, the rivalry between US and China may lead to a global financial crisis. Now, 
many countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Egypt and even Bangladesh are witnessing financial crisis. This is due to the Russia-Ukraine war and the associated global rise in oil prices. So, if a cold war emerges between China and the United States, again oil prices will continue to rise. So, it may lead to a global financial crisis. These two are the possible implications if the relationship between US and China continue to deteriorate. Okay, so that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw some of the reasons why the US-China relationship is deteriorating. After that, we saw some of the implications that will occur if the US and China relations continue to deteriorate in the future. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this editorial article. It talks about the AUKUS grouping and the Australian dilemma in acquiring a new nuclear submarine. The diesel-powered call-in-class submarines of Australia will retire soon from service. Now, Australia is looking to purchase a nuclear submarine from either US or UK. But there are challenges in this. This article is discussing about these challenges only. It also highlights the lessons which India should learn from this. Some detailed content of this article are not much relevant for our exam perspective. So, in this discussion, we will restrict ourselves to learn what's important by keeping in mind the UPSC syllabus. So, I have highlighted the syllabus here for your reference. You can go through it. First, here you should understand about something which is called as AUKUS. So, what is this AUKUS? In 2021, the US, the UK and Australia announced a security pact in the Asia-Pacific region. This pact is called as the AUKUS Pact or AUKUS Alliance. This pact was signed mainly to build joint defense capabilities and for technology transfer between the three countries. Now, the first major initiative of AUKUS is building nuclear submarines for Australia. So now, you would have understood why Australia is seeking to buy its next submarines from either US or UK. Here you may wonder how Australia could buy a nuclear submarine which uses high enriched uranium when Australia being a non-nuclear weapon state. For this, there is a loophole and Australia is making use of this loophole. See, the International Atomic Energy Agency has a comprehensive safeguard agreement. Under this agreement, non-nuclear weapon countries can withdraw fissile materials from submarine reactors. They can withdraw this from the International Atomic Energy Agency monitored stockpile itself. So, using this loophole, Australia being a non-nuclear weapon state is trying to buy nuclear submarines from either UK or US. You may also wonder how AUKUS is different from QUAD. See, the QUAD or the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue is a strategic dialogue between the United States, India, Australia and Japan. It has a shared vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Whereas AUKUS is more like a technology sharing arrangement. AUKUS, as I earlier told, is a trilateral security alliance that allows the United States and the United Kingdom to help Australia develop nuclear-powered submarines. Now, these arrangements remind me of one alliance, that is the Five Eyes. Which are the countries in the Five Eyes alliance? Mention them in the comment section. Now, let us come back to the discussion. Moving forward, we will see what are the challenges faced by Australia in this regard. Australia is taking AUKUS very seriously. The call-in class submarines will retire soon and this leaves Australia with a capability gap because while Australia's submarine class are soon retiring, China is posing an aggressive stance in the Asia-Pacific region. Now, Australia is seeking to fill the capability gap as early as possible to counter China. But will that happen? Australia has three options with it now. First is to purchase Virginia class submarines from US. Second is to purchase Austute class submarines from the UK. And third is to make a totally new design by using technologies from all its partners. But to make this decision is not very easy because Australia has its own set of constraints in terms of time, money and building crew. Firstly, if we take the US option, the US industrial base is already overwhelmed in constructing its own submarine fleets, which means they are already occupied, so the deadline will most probably extend beyond 2040. If we take the UK option, the UK will discontinue the astute class submarines after the 6th and the 7th vessels. Therefore, these two are not a viable option for Australia. And the third option through which Australia can build its own nuclear submarines also appears blurry. 
because of the export control regime of US. See the United States has a stringent export control and protocol regime. This could jeopardize the technology transfer agreements particularly in areas related to undersea capabilities and electronic warfare. In the United States, there is a classification known as no phone. This classification prohibits information sharing with non-US entities. This is a major barrier for Australia. This is where the author says that India should learn a lesson. The United States is having difficulty transferring technology even with its closest allies. The US export control regime is so rigid and archaic, it can't make room for priority transfer of technology to even its closest allies. So considering all this, India should be aware that acquiring critical technology from the United States will remain a difficult prospect. Besides these challenges for Australia, the regional partners also oppose the move of Australia to operate nuclear attack submarines because no one wants nuclear weapons in their backyard. So we will have to wait and watch for future updates in this regard. So these are the some of the points discussed by the author in the editorial. Moving forward, let us see few points on India-Australia relations. Firstly, Australia and India share historical relations and share many common values like pluralistic society, Westminster-style democracies that is parliamentary democracy and commonwealth traditions. Then in 2020, both the countries elevated their bilateral relationship from strategic partnership to comprehensive strategic partnership during the India-Australia Leaders Virtual Summit. In September 2021, the 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue took place and the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister of Australia visited India. In 2022, there has been series of high-level engagement and exchange of ministerial visits. Then a joint naval exercise called Aussie Index is carried out between India and Australia every year. Besides this, there is a huge community of Indian diaspora in Australia and India is now the third largest source of immigrants to Australia and the second largest source of skilled professional. These are some points about India-Australia relationship. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw some of the challenges that Australia could face in its process of acquiring nuclear submarine through the AUKUS dialogue. Then we saw some of the lessons that India can learn from the fiasco. Then we also saw some of the lessons that India can learn from the Australian experience of acquiring critical technology from United States. Finally, we saw some of the important points in the India-Australia relationship in recent times. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article. It says that a BJP MP has sought a termination of Congress leader Rahul Gandhi's membership of the Lok Sabha. A notice in this regard was moved to the Privilege Committee. So, in this context, we will try to understand about Privilege Committee. In the course of the discussion, we will also see about the procedure by which a MP is suspended by the Lok Sabha. So, first, we will understand about the Privilege Committee. See, each House of the Parliament and its committees collectively enjoy certain rights, privileges and immunities and its members individually enjoy certain privileges. The Privileges Committee examines each question involving breach of privilege of the House or the members of any committee referred to it by the House or by the Speaker. The committee consists of 15 members nominated by the Speaker in case of Lok Sabha and in case of Rajya Sabha there are 10 members nominated by the Chairman of the Rajya Sabha. The committee determines each case and see whether the breach of privilege is involved or not. It then makes suitable recommendation in this report to the presiding officer of the house. So this is all about the privilege committee. Moving forward, we will understand how a MP can be suspended by the Lok Sabha. See, the general principle is that it is the role and the duty of the presiding officer to maintain order in the house. This is to ensure that the house functions smoothly. In order to ensure proceedings are conducted in a proper manner, the speaker or the chairman is empowered to force a member to withdraw from the house. For this, you should know about Rule No. 373, 374 and 374A of the Rules of Procedure and Conduct of Business. As per Rule No. 373, the Speaker can direct a member to withdraw immediately from the House if he finds that the member's conduct is disorderly. Such a member should withdraw immediately and shall remain absent during the remainder of the day's sitting. Then moving on to Rule No. 374. 
Rule number 374 says that the speaker can name a member who disregards the authority of the chair or abuses the rules of the house by willfully obstructing the business in the house. And the member so named will be suspended from the house for the period that is less than the remainder of the session. For example, if there are 20 days left for the session to be completed, the member can be suspended for the period which is less than 20 days. Then, if a member is named by the speaker under rule number 374A, the member stands automatically suspended from the service of the house for five consecutive sittings or the remainder of the session, whichever is less. Like the speaker of the Lok Sabha, the chairman of Raja Sabha is also empowered under rule number 255 of its rule book to direct any members whose conduct is disorderly to withdraw immediately. Here you should know one more thing. Even though the speaker or the chairman is empowered to place a member under suspension, he has no authority to revoke the order. It is the house that must pass a motion regarding that. Okay. So let me repeat. Even though it is the presiding officers who enforce the suspension of a member, it is the house which must pass a resolution to revoke the order. Okay. It is not the discretion of the presiding officer to revoke the order. I hope I am clear. So with this, let us conclude this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the privilege committee and also the procedure for suspension of member in both the houses of the parliament. Now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Now look at this article here. It says that Nawab Muhammad Abdul delivered a toast to King Charles III of the UK on the occasion of the latest birthday. Also, the prince showed the historic scrolls of King George III dated 1770 which was addressed to his great ancestor Nawab Muhammad Ali Walaja, the then ruler of the Carnatic. This is about the news article given here. Using this opportunity, we will see about the Carnatic Wars. The Carnatic Wars were seen as a military showdowns between English and the French in the India's Carnatic region. Somewhere between 1746 and 1763, three Carnatic Wars were fought. So, all three Carnatic Wars were fought in the 18th century. In this discussion today, we will concentrate on the first Carnatic War. First, let us start with the causes of the war. The first Carnatic War was seen as the extension of the War of Austrian Succession, which happened in 1740. In this Austrian Succession War, England and France were in the opposite sides. When the war began in Europe, the English and the French companies requested for peace in India to their respective governments. The French government agreed but the British government did not accept the request of its company that is the British East India Company. So the British government dispatched a naval fleet with the view of destroying the French trade in India. English Navy under Commodore Curtis Bennett succeeded in destroying some French ships in the Indian Ocean. One of the destroyed ships belonged to Duplex. Duplex was the governor of the French company. So he was naturally enraged and decided to fight back the British. And that's how the first Carnatic War started in 1746. After this, Duplex sought the support of La Bourdonnais. La Bourdonnais is the French naval commander of Mauritius. He attacked Madras and captured it. But however, La Bourdonnais refused to hand over Madras to Duplex and he took rupees 60,000 as bribe from the English governor and went back. Duplex then attacked Madras and then he captured it. He promised Anwaruddin, who was the Nawab of the Carnatic, that he would give back Madras to the Nawab. This was done as a compensation for breaking the Nawab's decree of neutrality. But Duplex did not give Madras back to the Nawab. So the Nawab dispatched an army under command of his son to recapture Madras. The Nawab's army met the French army at Santom on the banks of the river Adayar. And in the famous Battle of Adayar, the large army of Nawab was easily defeated by the small and disciplined French force. After this, Duplex attempted to capture the English fort at St. David, but the mission ended in a failure. And in August 1948, an English fleet tried to capture Pondicherry, but it also failed to capture Pondicherry. This is about the course of the First Carnatic War. Now, we will end our discussion by seeing the results of the war. Firstly, Britain and France signed the Treaty of Axela Chapel in 1748 and therefore, peace was restored in India. Secondly, by the treaty, Madras was handed over to the English in exchange of Lubar in America to the France. See, even though the war did not create any change in the territorial possession of either party in India, it had major significance. 
the british and the french forces in india came to know about the military weakness of the indian rulers after the famous battle of adyar they found out that even a small disciplined english or french army can defeat indian rulers large army so this paved the way for duplex and clive to start laying the works for colonization european forces after the end of the first carnatic war decided to hop from the position of accommodation to the position of masters in india so this is all about the first carnatic war with this let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions we have four practice prelims questions today let us see them one by one let us take up the first question this is a three statement question three statements are given we have to find the correct statements let us take up the first statement speaker is empowered to place a member of parliament under suspension this statement is correct from our discussion we know that in order to ensure that proceedings are conducted in the house in proper manner speaker is empowered to force a member of parliament to withdraw from the house or place him or her under suspension so statement one is correct moving on to the second statement speaker is empowered to revoke the suspension of a member of parliament this statement is incorrect because this also we saw in our discussion the house is empowered to revoke the suspension if it desires it is not the speaker moving on to the third statement parliamentary proceedings cannot be questioned before a court this statement is correct under article 122 of the constitution parliamentary proceedings cannot be questioned before a court so statement 1 is correct 2 is incorrect and 3 is correct so the correct answer here is option c 1 and 3 only moving on to the second question two statements about zero budget natural farming is given we have to find the correct statement let us take the first statement zero budget natural farming was popularized by subhash palekar who is a padma vibhushan recipient this statement is incorrect mr subhash palekar is a padma shri recipient and not padma vibhushan recipient so statement 1 is incorrect moving on to the second statement the main components of zero budget natural farming is bijjamitra jeevamitra achadan and vapasa this statement is correct these four are the main elements of zero budget natural farming so statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct so the correct answer here is option b two only moving on to the third question it is a pair based question three pairs are given we have to find which of the pairs are correctly matched actually all the three pairs given here are correctly matched first carnatic war ended with the treaty of axilla chapel second carnatic war ended with the treaty of puducherry and the third carnatic war ended with the treaty of paris so all the three pairs given here are correctly matched so the correct answer here is option d 1 2 and 3 moving on to the fourth question this is a quiz question for you it is a map based question based on the map we saw during our west bank discussion interested aspirants can write the answer for this question in the comment section the main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here interested aspirants can write the answers for this question and post it in the comment section if you like today's video like comment and share the video with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation you can subscribe to shankar ias academy's youtube channel Thank you for listening.